The attempt just made by some royalists at choice was connected with the secret machinations of the partisans of the House of Bourbon to draw to it at the same time the attention of the French and then the Allied sovereigns of the French by giving sanction in our provinces to the opinion that the white colors alone could disarm the enmity of the allies of the sovereigns by holding out to them that shadow of a royalist party as a real party and its colors under which a small number of disheartened individuals fled to take refuge as an appeal made by public opinion in favor of the ancient family. What fear had thus commenced in some departments in spite of the people seemed on the point of being accomplished by hostile influence in spite of the allies themselves. Whatever may have been said by the Prince of Liechtenstein and the subject, England had seriously undertaken the restoration of the Bourbons and the intrigues of her agents assumed in every quarter a more decided character. It became necessary to intimate their presumption by putting the severity of the laws in force against them. In such circumstances, the jealousy of authority sometimes punishes on the slightest appearance of guilt. In this case, a weak or cruel prince would have found but too many pretenses for the shedding of tarts of blood. But Napoleon had, until then, rejected all severe proceedings. So much was he disgusted at the remedy of executions. Reasons of state at length spoke so emphatically that he was compelled to listen to them. Entrance of the Count d'Artois into French Comte had been just ascertained. Not only that prince and his sons seemed to come forward for the purpose of convulsing France from one extremity to the other, but the head of their house, Louis the Eighteenth himself, had succeeded in getting his addresses, his insinuations, his pardons, and his promises circulated in Paris. He wrote from the bosom of his retreat in. Hartwell in England, to the principal functionaries of the empire, to the senators, to the members of the council, and of the magistracy. His letters had been clandestinely delivered to those to whom they were addressed, and some of those who had received them were already calculating the chances of a new revolution. Secret rumors began to be heard in the capital, while the conspiracy broke out in the provinces, occupied by the enemy, and more particularly in the south. Such was the substance of the latest accounts received from all quarters. The affairs of the royalists of choice were but too much aggravated by this state of things. The infliction of punishment became a duty, yet in adopting that measure, the field of battle by which we were surrounded was probably the decisive consideration. Every day, every instant, some of our people were destroyed by the enemy in the midst of that incessant slaughter. The life of an obscure conspirator had scarcely any weight in the sanguinary balances of war. Among the names of those who had been designated as guilty by the public outcry, those of two ancient emigrants accused by the whole town, not only of having worn the white cockade and resumed the cross of St. Louis, but also of having publicly attempted to influence the Emperor of Russia in favor of the cause of the Bourbons were retained. They were the Sieurs Gauveau and Vigenja. The latter took refuge at Chaumont, but Gauveau remained. He was crushed by the thunderbolt, which he defiled. He was brought before the council of war and doomed to be made an example. The affair of the armistice occupied the remainder of the morning. Another aide-de-camp of Prince Schwarzenberg arrived from Barcer Alb, to which place the headquarters of the allies had been then removed. He came to propose the village of Lusigny near Vanduvra for the meeting of the generals entrusted with the negotiation of the armistice. He announced that General Duca was appointed commissioner for Austria and that the other commissioners were General Shuvala for Russia and General Rauk for Prussia. Napoleon, on his part, nominated his aide de camp, General Flau. He instantly prepared to send him off, dictated his instructions, and gave them to him after a long conference. After General Flau's departure, Napoleon, exhausted with fatigue, had just retired to his chamber when the family of Goval presented itself in tears at the door for the purpose of imploring his pardon. Napoleon was incapable of resisting these solicitations for mercy. His clemency is attested by numerous and extraordinary instances of forgiveness, but on this occasion he had determined to prove inexorable. 
He had taken precautions against his own weakness and thought the most effectual security was that of preventing anyone from approaching his person. The equerry on duty was, however, from the neighborhood of Troyes. His name was Mesgrigny. He wished to be useful to his country folks, and he was assisted by all those who were on duty with him. Napoleon was scarcely awake when Gauveau's petition was presented to him. But was there still time to save that unfortunate man? A messenger was dispatched to the chief of the staff. The prince of Neuchâtel sent word that the sentence must have been executed. Napoleon wished at least to have the fact ascertained. An orderly officer hastened to the spot. It was too late. Napoleon was silent for a long time and at length exclaimed, He was condemned by the law. During the 25th and 26th, all attention was exclusively fixed on the conferences at Lusigny. A continual alternation of fear and hope prevailed. Couriers, orderly officers, and aides de camp were in constant movement along the road of Vendouvre. It was at one time believed that intelligence of the cessation of hostilities had been received. At another, that fresh engagements had taken place. On the morning of the 27th, no decisive intelligence had yet been received from General Flao. The military question was, however, too simple in itself to give rise to great difficulties. But political views had entered into the negotiation and involved it in a singular complication. The only point the enemy had in view in these conferences was a suspension of arms, but Napoleon's aim was more extensive. He wished to take advantage of the opportunity for fixing the basis of a definitive peace. He was desirous of keeping Antwerp and the coast of Belgium as a reward of his last successes, but Antwerp constituted, with respect to England, the whole of the negotiation, and that concession was, through English influence, to be obstinately refused at the Congress of Châtillon. It therefore became indispensable to have that point taken into consideration upon other ground. The importance of Antwerp might be diminished in the disinterested eyes of the Russian, Austrian, and Prussian generals. It was consequently Napoleon's object to obtain an anticipation of the question in the military conference of Lusigny. But while it remained undecided, he could not consent to deprive himself by a premature truce of the advantages which the pursuit of the Austrians seemed to hold out to him for completing the defeat of the Allies. Accordingly, the French army had not lost an instant in pressing hard upon the Austrians. The enemy's headquarters had fallen back as far as Kolenbeck. The Russian guard had retreated on Langre and Liechtenstein's corps on Dijon. The Allied sovereigns had retired to Chaumont in Bassigny, and our troops were taking possession of Lusigny at the very moment when the commissioners for the armistice assembled there. That military possession of Lusigny had even given rise to difficulties in the commencement of the conferences, but more serious obstacles presented themselves shortly afterwards when the line of the armistice came to be discussed. The status quo of the two armies had been proposed by the enemy's generals. General Flao, conformably to his instructions, had required that the line should extend from Antwerp, where we had General Carnot, to Lyon, where we had Duke de Castiglione. The forces of France would, by that line, have been placed upon a single front from the Scheldt as far as the Alps. The Russian and Prussian commissioners, pretending to consider themselves uninfluenced by the last events, thought the sacrifice too great for the sake of a little delay, of which the Austrian army stood in need to rest its columns. The Austrian general was more conciliating, but as a result of the diplomatic forms which the conferences had assumed, each commissioner felt himself under the necessity of applying for fresh instructions. And while these were waited for, time was consumed. The moments, however, which were thus spent were of the highest value. Our horizon was suddenly covered with black clouds, which could have been dispersed only by an armistice. We arrived at the critical period of the campaign. Chapter 7, Third Expedition Against Marshal Blucher, Napoleon's Return to the Marne, End of February when Napoleon dictated his claims to the commissioner whom he sent to Lusigny. The suspension of hostilities demanded by the Allies was generally considered as capable of being advantageous to the Austrian army only, whose total defeat it would have prevented. It was little thought that the armistice might hold out an equivalent advantage to the French army in suspending the operations of Marshal 
Blucher. The diversion undertaken by the Prussians, of which we are about to give an account, was at length ascertained, but at too late a period. In order to preserve the connection of events, we shall for a moment retrace our steps. After the Battle of Auchan, we left Marshal Blucher separated from his lieutenants, beaten like them, operating a hasty retreat towards Chalon sur Marne, and ignorant of the condition to which he might be reduced by that retreat. Fortune did not long continue unfavorable to him. Napoleon, who was called back the next day towards Nongy and Montereau, ceased to press hard upon him. Blucher was now pursued by the Duc de Raguz alone, and the latter was himself soon compelled to give up the pursuit and return to Montmirail to attack a body of troops sent by Prince Schwarzenberg on that side to the assistance of the Prussians, while the Duc de Raguz engaged in the pursuit of that body, proceeded to occupy a position at Cezanne. Blucher took advantage of the opportunity by rallying under his command the court of Sacken and of York. The latter had on their part escaped the pursuit of the Duke de Treviso by a concurrence of circumstances no less fortunate than those by which their commander-in-chief had been extricated. The Prussian corps of Bulov and the Russian divisions of Vit. Zinkaroda and Vorenzov, after having taken possession of Belgium, had passed their ancient frontier of the north. Their advanced guard, penetrating across the Ardennes, had pushed on as far as the gates of Soissons. The wanted good walls and a numerous garrison were supplied by the talents of General Ruska, who commanded there. But that brave general was killed by one of the first shots that were fired. And in consequence of his death, the place speedily surrendered to General Vincent Garota. The Russians entered it the 13th of February, precisely in time to collect the flying remains of Sackett in York, escaped from the battle, fought the preceding day at Chateau Thierry. These troops, while rallying at Soissons, having learnt that their commander-in-chief, Blucher, was himself rallying his forces on the side of Chalon, immediately began their march to effect a junction with him by the way of Reims. The Russians were desirous to keep possession of the important place of Soissons, but that town was retaken by the Duke de Treviso on the 19th of February. Marshal Blucher had consequently succeeded a few days after his defeats in collecting all his forces and was in the point of receiving reinforcements, which were on their march in the direction of the north and Lorraine. On the 18th of February, he found himself in a state to hasten in his turn to the assistance of Schwarzenberg. He marched from the banks of the Marne and encamped with 50,000 men at the confluence of the Alb and the Seine. He had been strengthened on his route at the bivouac of Somisson by a fresh reinforcement of 9,000 men belonging to Legereau's corps, and he trusted that a general junction of all the allied forces before Troyes would stop Napoleon and produce the same results as at Brienne. It was not consequently a single detachment of the army of Silesia, which we had fallen in with at Mary, as we had for some days thought. But the vanguard of the whole of that army, Blucher had in person taken part in the action of the Bridge of Mary and was wounded there in the leg. He had not determined to retreat until convinced with his own eyes of the impossibility of rallying Schwarzenberg's army before choice and of the future inutility of the projection. Junction. He then resolved to repass the Owl, but his retreat concealed one of the boldest plans of the campaign, encouraged by the reinforcements which continually joined him, whether he had received orders to that effect from his cabinet or whether he was influenced by his own enterprising spirit. Blucher determined to advance again upon Paris and attempt the grand diversion in favor of the Austrian army. Thus, while the main body of the French army was in the vicinity of Troy, occupied with armistice and with peace, the Prussian troops made a rapid descent on the two banks of the Marne. The Duc de Ragusa forced on the 24th to abandon Cezanne, retreated by La Ferté Gaucher on La Ferté Soujouar on the other side of the Marne. The Duc de Treviso, after leaving a garrison in Soissons, retreated also on La Ferté-Soujouar. <laughs>